listening to Bad Dog Agility, bringing you training tips, interviews, and news about the great sport of dog agility. I'm Jennifer. I'm Esteban. And I'm Sarah. And this is episode 268. Today's podcast is brought to you by hitaboard.com. Hitaboard.com has the innovative training tools you need for agility. Having problems with a dog walker A-frame? The Hit It Board can fix that. Your dog doesn't like tugging? They'll love the tug it. Can't move your A-frame around by yourself? The move it can. Go to hititboard.com and use discount code BDA10 to get 10% off your order. That's hititboard.com. Today, we're going to ask the question, are you using too many call-offs in your agility handling? And first, Sarah, what exactly is a call-off for people who don't know what that is? Well, that's the phrase that we use for when your dog is headed for an off course and you yell their name really loud or scream come and you barely get them back in time. You don't get the off course. You save the run. Everybody's happy, clean run, maybe even a first place. But there was that moment in time where your dog was sure they were going elsewhere and you had to uh, you know, scream really loud to get their attention. I thought everybody knew what a call-off was until I was talking with Jennifer Crank, who lives in Ohio. Sarah and I are down here in Texas, and now we think maybe this is a Southern thing. Jennifer, do we not have call-offs in Ohio? Is everybody just that good at agility up there? Yeah, when the question came through, it was a question submitted to us, and we, we discussed it for a podcast. I was like, a call-off? What's a call-off? And I guess it's just not a term that we use a lot, but what you described, Sarah, exactly the scenario that you described, super common. Dogs headed towards <laughs> the wrong obstacle, handlers scream something, their name or a, a specific word to get them back on course. But I don't, I don't even know what we call it. I'd almost have to think that through. Like, kind of more of a redirect. We have a tendency to scream. Like a lot of people around here, they want to go, Hey, they go, Hey, 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 you know, or like call the dog in that manner. But uh, I guess I haven't ever used that term call off in a teaching scenario. We're all about telling them where to go, not about where not to go. So we're going to, we're trying to be pro proactive on that. Yeah. And I think you've gotten right to the, the, the key point here. And that is the difference between proactive and reactive handling, right? So as both of you have explained very well, if your dog is headed in the wrong direction and now you are having to make an adjustment, this isn't something that you walked or really planned, right? The dog's headed the wrong way. You need to throw in a little something extra. Usually you're going to call the dog's name. Apparently in Ohio, you're going to yell, hey, hey, hey. Uh, and uh, you're going to hope that you can get the dog back on course, right? So you're reacting to something unexpected that's happened. Uh, that's a deviation from your plan, the plan that you walked through and oh so carefully thought about in advance. When you're proactive and the dog always knows where they're going, you have a very smooth run, there isn't going to be that potential for off course if you planned everything right. Okay, so I think that's the first thing, understanding there's a difference between proactive and reactive handling. Well, it turns out that uh, I think there's some very fundamental pros and cons because the question is this, if we are, we're all sitting here, the three of us, and we say, okay, calling off your dog, that shouldn't happen. We should all be proactive handlers. Well, then why does it exist, right? Why do people need call-offs? Why does the terminology even exist? I think one obvious reason is, well, you have beginners and they're not very good at being proactive yet, right? Their, their reactions aren't there or their planning isn't that good. Their dogs get into sticky situations because they can't see them in advance, right? They don't have that experience. Okay, I'm going to give give you that. But then what about the other group of people? So we all know handlers who have probably had half a dozen dogs at this point, been in the sport 10, 15, 20 years, and are very, uh, shall I put it, uh, call off heavy in their handling style, right? So what's going on there? Why is this persisting? Well, I think that um, people... I mean, it, it is a fast paced sport. And so I think that um, people will get into a situation where the run kind of starts to get away from them, right? Their dog is going faster than they anticipated, or they aren't able to keep up and things get more and more and more frantic as they go through the course. So, you know, the first turn maybe goes pretty okay at obstacle three. The second turn at obstacle six, things are getting a little hairy. By the time we get to obstacle nine on a jumper's course, they are barely holding on and everything is reactive. Mm. Okay. And those, I think I, go ahead. 
Well, those can often be the runs that from a from a spectator standpoint or from your friends or for the crowd that people will constantly reinforce you for because they're really exciting to watch right you're on the edge of your seat and the the crowd's going crazy and your friends come oh my gosh great save that was an amazing save we're the same dog going out there or not the same dog, a different dog on the same course is going out there really smooth, really proactive, very clear. There's no adrenaline pumping. You watch that and you're like, that was nice. Golf clap, you know, <laughs> compared to, uh, you know, at Westminster when Pink was headed towards the wrong end of the tunnel because I was late and I had this remarkable save and everybody was like, whoa, you know, going crazy, which, you know, I think for a lot of people, that reaction from spectators or friends or whatever can be reinforcing to them. But beyond that, I think what can be reinforcing is the cue. So if what you've been doing is working and you're you're talking about people who have a history of this uh, reactive handling, I mean, they, they're, they're so consistent with being late that they had to name how they save it with, a, with the term call off, right? I mean, basically, we, right. we were so consistently late that we had to put a name to it called a call off that it's clearly working because if it wasn't working, they would be changing what they're doing. So when you talk about call offs being um, like showing up over the history of one particular handler or uh, a dog, it's working. It's getting reinforced, both whether it be from the crowd or friends or people being really excited about that run or even the queue. But we got to ask the question of, okay, it's working, but it's working for what? It's working for the queue. Is it getting you the fastest time? Is it getting you the fastest dog? And more mm-hmm. importantly, is it getting you the happiest dog? Because think about it from the dog's perspective. If everything's happening late, if I'm headed towards what I perceive to be the correct obstacle and the handler goes, no, 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 no. And then I have to turn. I mean, you're basically telling me that everything that I think I'm doing right is wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. The dog's not maliciously going towards the off course. They're not going, hey, let me see what happens if I do this. They're going Mm -hmm. because that's genuinely what they think is correct. And then all of a sudden they get hollered out often in like a negative, you know, fluffy, get over here. You know, not a, hey, fluffy, come on over. They're getting yelled at for doing what they think is right. So, uh, you know, we really got to watch it. Yeah, maybe it's working, but is it really the best option for the dog? Yeah, I think that's such a an insightful thing that you're uh, pointing out here. There's just so much positive reinforcement for the cue. It affects so many different uh, behaviors for the handler, for us as handlers, right? To get this qualifying run, to get the ribbon, to get our double cues, to get our qualifications. Uh, you know, you can't win if you don't run clean. And so there's a, there's a lot of incentive for us to do that. And uh, definitely the way the audience response can be a uh, part of that. Uh, you know, I think of a, a football game where, you know, a receiver catches a touchdown pass, they catch it nice and cleanly. Yeah. There's going to be lots of cheering, <laughs> but imagine if that guy bobbles it and it bounces off a couple of helmets and up in the air <laughs> and then he catches it. Well, that's the kind of thing that's going to become a legend. Right, right, right. right? They're going to show that for the next 30 years on, on highlight. Play of the day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Play of the year. Uh, they're going to win an SB. Um, so, you know, those are, those are really high profile. Um, I want to talk a little more about what you were saying about, um, how the dog can now start to feel that they're wrong because here's where dog personality really becomes important. There are some dogs that, uh, it it doesn't bother them so much. You know, if they're headed the wrong way and you yell at them to come, they're going to come and they're going to come as fast, fast as they possibly can. And they're going to continue to run agility as fast as they can. But there are other dogs who are going to take being wrong very personally. You know, we usually call these dogs sensitive dogs. Nowadays, a lot of people talk about dogs having big feelings. Okay. And these are dogs that, um, yeah, you know, they they don't really appreciate being told one thing and then being uh, told something else, right? They're very sure they're on this line to the tunnel because you, in fact, put them on that line to the tunnel. And now that they're about you know, one third of the way to the tunnel, you're changing their line and you're changing it in a very um, loud way, right? Which as Jennifer pointed out, can be uh, construed uh, negatively on the part of the dog. And what that really does here is erodes the dog trust, the dog's trust in your ability to handle, right? And so Sarah, if you're that dog, what is that kind of sensitive dog? What is one response that you might have? How, How are you going to adjust the way you run 
agility in the future. Right. Well, you know, the faster I'm going towards that off course tunnel, the fast, the harder it is for me to change my line. So one very obvious thing that I can do is why don't I just, you know, you handler are a little frantic. Why don't I just bring the whole pace down a little bit, right? Let's just do this whole thing a little bit slower and then you can get your commands out and I can go to the right way and and we get the cue and we're all happy. (laughs) And I get my treats, right? And this is the this is the best response for me to keep things, you know, positive and happy mm-hmm. and to not get myself in trouble. I, when I go fast, I get into trouble more often than when I go slow. Right, right. And I think that's one of the really insidious things that people don't notice that's happening, right? Ways that they are actually making their dogs slow. They, they blame the dog's personality a lot. Certainly personality drive, motivation that's intrinsic to a dog, those are all factors. And those are factors that often we can't change very much as uh, trainers and handlers, but we can certainly teach our dogs to uh, respond to our handling. And this is one of those ways, right? They're going to over respond in a bad direction. And that bad direction is going to be a drop in speed, right? I think you will also see uh, in some dogs more checking in, Mm -hmm. right? Especially as they clear a jump, they will literally head check especially when they head towards things like tunnels. And uh, you can see differences um, there. Uh, Okay, so now we know what call-offs are. We've kind of defined the problem. Um, We've shown you how they're good, right? You may be saving your runs and getting cues, uh, but how even that good can be kind of bad. Yeah. And I think actually, once we got Jennifer, you know, talking about it and not thinking so hard about the name, it just came out. She she called it a save. She said, I had this really great save with pink. That's what she calls the call off. Oh, yeah, that, okay. that's save. right. Now that you yeah. say that, I'm like, yeah, that's yeah. exactly what I would do. Because right, it, it has all the implications, right? Correct. To, to, to have to save something means it was in jeopardy, right? Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. there we go. Call off, save, same thing. Right. Okay, good. I like that. That's uh, very good. Okay. So uh, before we end this podcast, I just want to talk about one more thing and it's the different kinds of runs that we have. So we have games and organizations and I know Jen, you're a huge games fan. I'm the opposite of a games fan. I'm like, show me the jumpers, show me the standard run. And that's all I want to do. I want to do my two runs and that's it. Um, And so uh, games, the game I'm thinking of here, sometimes gambler, sure. But mostly I'm thinking of snooker. Mm. snooker type courses mm-hmm. where there's a lot of what we would call call offs and what you might call saves, right? It's, it's a game that's a little bit harder uh, to do. And I've told beginners who are really struggling with their handling where they're very reactive and the dog is very confused and it has a dramatically negative impact on their speed and performance and agility to the point where the dog is like, I, I don't really want to be here. I don't want to do this with you. I'm like, okay, let's just maybe for several shows. Let's stay away from the snickers. Let's stay away from the gamblers. Let's uh, get the dog in a rhythm where everything is very predictable and uh, help them out. What are your thoughts on this coming from both the beginner's perspective, but also the expert perspective, especially with, with respect to these games? I would say in, as a whole, I 100% agree. I really think as a new team, sticking with a numbered course where you can prioritize communicating to the dog where you want them to go and not focusing on where you don't want them to go. I think that's how a lot of times people think about snookers. They're like, well, well, don't take that jump and don't take that jump and don't let them go there. Focus on telling your dog where to go, mm. not on telling them where not to go. Now, kind of looking at it from a more advanced stage, I think there could be some initial confusion um, when we talk about call-offs and somebody might be out there listening to this thinking, well, you know, what about a bypass, getting my dog to run past an obstacle? Mm -hmm. But training a bypass, having a specific skill that means to your dog, don't take that obstacle is or, or run at my side right? You know, kind of slappy tappy hit your side to me is very different than a dog who gets on a line for the wrong obstacle and then has to be redirected off. So in the case of snookers, if I have to go from one jump to another and I have to ask my dog to bypass the tunnel, I'm not going to let him head there and then call him off of it. Right? So that would be like the call off or the save. My dog was headed. I'm going to communicate to them from the time they take off for the jump, that we are in no way, shape, or form going towards the tunnel. So there never should be a redirect. The dog should be on the line or on the task at all times. So 
can, can you do snooker? Can you do games fast and efficiently without call offs? Absolutely. But it does require a greater skill set because you have to have the ability to run with the dog at your side. You have to have the ability to go greater distances. So that's just more things that you would have to train. So can you do it? Absolutely. But it's going to require a a greater set of skills in your toolbox. So I 100% agree that starting with, you know, the standard, the jumpers, where generally speaking, if you can be proactive in your handling, the dog will land in front of the next obstacle. All right. So in snookers, that's not always the case. You can have perfect handling and the dog can land and have to navigate around something. So it just requires a greater skill set. So don't confuse a call off, which in my mind is the dog headed for the wrong thing. And you reactively saying, no, don't do that with a bypass, which is information given proactively that you do not want them to take an obstacle. So I I think that's kind of where you're looking at the difference and where there could be some confusion and that greater skill set needed to go into those games. Yeah, those are great points. And I think for those of you out there who didn't know what a call-off was and now you realize that maybe you're doing it quite a bit, uh, there's no need to feel bad about it. Now that you're aware of it, you know that it's something that you're mostly going to work to eliminate in your handling by being more proactive rather than reactive. Right. And it, that was kind of one thing that I wanted to say in wrapping up is that, you know, a call off is, is just an indication that for whatever reason, your dog didn't know where they were supposed to go or um, they not just that they didn't know, but that they thought they knew, but it was wrong. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that can happen to anybody because you just make a mistake on course or you didn't see the trap that that your dog sees, right? You didn't realize how much your dog was going to be taking three straight jumps straight towards the tunnel and they weren't supposed to take the tunnel and you didn't recognize that as a really, really big trap for your dog. So in that case, you know, the learning there for you is on kind of the course analysis side, right? But if you are a handler who routinely course after course has, you know, two to three call offs every single run, then I think um, rather than just saying, well, this is a just a random mistake, you have to look and say, my timing is probably off across the board right? My timing across all of agility, I am not giving my dog the information when they need it. And a lot of times that is because you have a really, really, really fast driven dog who is going to make decisions early and be very confident in themselves. Um, So when we talk about the two different personalities of dogs, and we said these call-offs can really hurt the personality of, I mean, can really hurt the dog that has that softer personality and they start slowing down. Well, the flip side is you may end up kind of in this escalation of call-offs with the really confident dog because they decide so early and they're so sure of themselves and they don't have that dip in confidence. So you need to take a look at your handling and see um, how you can figure out what changes you need to make to your handling to give your fast driven dog information in a more timely way. And I will say that if you feel that the handling was on point, you were told by your instructor that your handling was good, your timing was good, your execution was perfect, yet your dog's still headed to the off course and you still needed to call them off, make sure you evaluate the trained skill as well. So I would say that most of the call-offs that I see are timing with the handling, but I have seen scenarios where the handler is pretty good, the timing is good, the decel is on time, but maybe in the case of like a U-shaped tunnel discrimination, the trained threadle verbal isn't solid enough. So, you know, I don't want you to think that it's that it's always timing. It's probably timing. But as Sarah just commented on, there's something they're not clear on. And if it's not you in in the moment with your timing, do evaluate, well, is my dog's understanding of that skill where it needs to be? Uh, And I think that can be can be tough for people because they they might be great. Their instructor might say that timing's great. And then they go, well, my dog was just being bad. Well, your dog is lacking the understanding and you're going to have to go back to foundations on do they understand what that verbal means or do they understand what that set of cues means? So in case that situation happens, be prepared that there's possibly a hole in the training of the skill or timing of the handling. Exactly. All right. Well, that's it for this week's podcast. We'd like to thank our sponsor, hitaboard.com. Happy training.